Welcome. This is Cheryl Slacta with the Food Protection and Facilities Program of North Carolina. This course is designed to give an overview of the rules governing the sanitation of adult day service facilities. It includes information about the rules and how to document violations on the inspection form. The rules governing the sanitation of adult day service facilities are listed under 15A NCAC 18A 3300. Please make sure to have a copy of these rules and inspection form 4054 to reference during this presentation. A link to these rules is provided on the North Carolina Division of Public Health, Environmental Health Services section, Food Protection and Facilities website. Let's start with the definitions, 3301. Uh, the definitions, this uh, includes adult day service, adult day health service, psychosocial rehabilitation programs and other day programs which do not provide overnight accommodations. Environmental health does not issue a permit to these facilities. Therefore, no permit action may be taken. A license or certificate is obtained from the North Carolina Division of Health Service Regulation, otherwise known as DHSR, for these programs. Rule 3302, plans drawn to scale and specifications for changes, uh, possibly to building dimensions, kitchen specifications, or other modifications to an existing adult day service facility shall also be uh, submitted to the local health department for review and approval prior to construction. The initial inspection for new construction or the first inspection following modifications to existing adult day service facilities shall not be made by the local health department unless these plans have been approved. For new or proposed adult day service facilities, a site visit to evaluate and assist in meeting the requirements of this section may be requested by the operator prior to submission of plans and it shall be conducted within 30 days uh, of the request to the local health department. Unannounced inspections of adult day service facilities shall be made by an environmental health specialist or otherwise known as an EHS at least once a year. An original and one copy of the inspection of adult day service facility form 4054 shall be completed by the EHS. The adult day service facility operator and the EHS shall each retain a copy. If the environmental health specialist determines that conditions found at the adult day service facility at the time of an inspection are dangerous to the health of the participants, the environmental health specialist shall notify the licensing or certifying agency within 24 hours by verbal contact. And the document uh, shall be sent up to them within two working days following the inspection. Notification of dangerous conditions found at an adult daycare or adult day health service facility shall be made to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Division of Aging. Notifications involving dangerous conditions found at a psychosocial rehabilitation center shall be made to the Department of Health and Human Services Division of Health Service Regulation. An EHS may conduct an inspection of any adult daycare facility as frequently as necessary in order to ensure compliance with applicable sanitation standards. Now, we're going to highlight different sections of the inspection form to go into further detail. So this top section uh, is where we would end, uh, put the score at the end of the inspection and end of the write-up the date of the inspection, the status code, health department, and the current facility ID number. The classification will, type will be based on the inspection, and I will discuss that further near the end of this presentation. This section uh, includes water supply information, wastewater info, if a water sample was taken, um, and the purpose of the visit, also the maximum capacity, if that is um, important to know, especially for uh, on-site systems. Talking about water supply, um, community, of course, would be a public water supply. Transient non-community is a private water supply that does not regularly serve at least 25 of the same persons for more than six months. A non-transient non-community system 
is a private water supply that serves at least 25 of the same persons for more than six months. Typically, small residential care homes would be considered to be served by a non-public water supply if used in a private well. And demographical information goes here uh, for the facility. Make sure that this information is up to date and that it matches what is listed on the license. We'll go in a little deeper into the inspection form where you will see the uh, violation item numbers. You will see rule headings for each section. You also will have brief descriptions of the requirements that will be listed um, along with the demerits. And six point demerits will be in bold on this inspection form. And then you see just non bolded um, items would be anything under six for demerits. For each violation noted, we ask that you circle the demerit deduction and write that number on the corresponding line beside it. Add all demerits and indicate total demerit number deducted in the space at the top of the inspection form. Document violations observed on a comment addendum. Be clear on what was observed and the details of the violation. Do not forget to check the box at the bottom of the inspection form if a comment addendum is attached. It is important to review the file and the history of the facility prior to any inspection. This is the um, also the basic equipment that is shown here that will be needed for uh, to conduct a good inspection. And upon arrival, we recommend asking the operator if anyone in the facility has a communicable disease where extra caution is needed. Single use gloves can be worn in the facility if the uh, EHS feels more comfortable wearing them, especially in bathrooms or clothes changing areas. Um, however, it's not required, but we would ask that you adhere to proper glove usage um, during this inspection. Hair restraints would be needed uh, in any food service areas. Now we're going to go into uh, a little deeper into the rules. 3304 is going to address food supplies. There's quite a bit of information here under this rule. Food shall be in good condition, free from spoilage, filth, or other contamination, and safe for human consumption. And yes, they can serve shellfish uh, at an adult day service facility. If they choose to do that, of course, it must come from approved sources and tags must be retained for 90 days. Raw eggs or products containing raw eggs shall not be consumed by the participants. Uh, so things like raw cookie dough, cake batter, brownie mix, milkshakes, ice cream, and other food products containing raw eggs should not be consumed. Uh, but a pasteurized egg product may be used as a substitute. Beverages and food sent from home shall be fully prepared, dated, and identified for the appropriate participant at the participant's home. Uh, any formula or other bottled beverages shall be returned to the participant's home or discarded at the end of every day. More on 3304. Um, again, I'm going to point out multiple violations under this one rule here. Uh, so listen up. Dis drinking utensils uh, provided by the adult day service facility shall be sanitized in accordance with this section. Formula and other beverages which require refrigeration and pureed food after opening shall be refrigerated at 45 degrees or below. Note this is different from the current North Carolina food code. And also uh, the cold temperature would be a violation of number two on this inspection sheet. Commercially prepared pureed foods shall be served from a single serving dish rather than the food container. Upon opening, containers of pureed food shall be covered, dated with the date of opening, and refrigerated. Any violation here would be noted under number three on the inspection form. Adult day service facilities receiving prepared ready to eat meals from outside sources shall use only catered meals obtained from a food handling permitted or a food, excuse me, food handling establishment permitted or inspected by a local health department. Any violation of uh, this would be under number one. And then also during transportation, food shall meet the requirements of these rules. Uh, that are relating to food protection and storage. And these, uh, both of these would, or one, they could be, sorry, documented as a violation of number three or number five. 
All bag lunches containing potentially hazardous foods shall be refrigerated in accordance with this section, and if not, it's a violation of number two. Moving on to Rule 3305, food protection. Uh, we definitely want all food to be protected at all times um, from any sorts of potential contamination, including dust, insects, rodents, unclean equipment, utensils, unnecessary handling, coughing, sneezing, flooding, drainage, overhead leakage, or any type of um, condensation drippage. And those items would, uh, would make it a violation of number five. The temperature of potentially hazardous food shall be uh, between 40, I'm sorry, 45 or less uh, degrees or 140 degrees Fahrenheit or above at all times, noting again the difference between the North Carolina Food Code. And this is even during transportation, including field trips or um, any other time that it may be uh, being transported. This will be a violation of number two on the inspection form. And lastly, in the event of a fire, flood, power outage, or similar event that might result in the contamination of food, um, or something that could prevent the food from being held properly at the right temperatures, the person in charge shall immediately contact the local health department. Food storage rule 3306, open food stored in approved tightly covered containers and it shall be um, labeled and they shall be impervious and non-absorbent. So number five, that would be a, a violation of number five. Food not stored in the product container or package in which it was obtained, as I just mentioned, um, must also be labeled with the common name. Food shall be stored above the floor, of course, uh, and in a manner that would prevent any sort of splash or other contamination and permit easy cleaning of the storage area. Food and containers of food shall not be stored under exposed or unprotected sewer lines, water lines, uh, except for possibility, possibly fire protection sprinkler heads um, that are required by law. Food shall not be stored in toilet or laundry rooms. Uh, all food shall be stored in a manner to protect it. And packaged food such as milk or other fluid containers may be stored in undrained ice as long as any individual units are not submerged in the water. Wrapped sandwiches may not be stored in direct contact with ice. Hot storage is going to be covered uh, under this rule and would be a violation of number two on the inspection form. And hot food storage equipment shall be provided so that it has enough space and the capacity to maintain uh, hot temperatures of 140 degrees or above. Each hot food unit shall be provided with a numerically scaled indicating thermometer uh, that is located to measure the air temperature in the coolest part of the unit and it should be located to be easily readable. Recording thermometers may also be used in lieu of indicating thermometers, uh, and then where it is impractical to install thermometers on the equipment, such as on steam tables shown here, steam kettles, heat lamps, or other insulated food transport carriers, a metal stem type numerically scaled product thermometer shall be available and used to check the internal temperatures of food. This will be a violation of number six. Uh, the internal temperature of foods requiring hot storage shall be 140 degrees or above, except during necessary periods of preparation and service. Potentially hazardous food to be transported hot shall be held at 140 or above, and that would be also under number two on the inspection form. Rule 3307, this goes into food preparation. Foods shall be prepared with the least possible manual contact with utensils and on surfaces that have been cleaned, rinsed, and sanitized prior to use in order to prevent cross-contamination. This will be a violation of number 10. And I just want you to note that we said least possible manual contact. So there is a, there's no, no bare hand contact information here in these rules like we have in the food code and the 2600 rules. Food contact surfaces and utensils must be cleaned and sanitized when switching from processing raw to ready to eat foods. Uh, that is also a violation of number 10. Raw fruits and vegetables shall be thoroughly washed with potable water before being cooked or served. And that would be a violation of number three. Uh, also thawing, uh, if thawing is not done as it is listed on this slide, 
then that would as well be a violation of number three. Note some of these final cook cooking temperatures vary from the North Carolina Food Code and the 2600 rules, uh, but we do have poultry and stuffed meats um, <clears throat> and reheated after cooking and cooling must reach 165 degrees. Um, it says all foods other than the ones listed would have to reach a temperature of 140, which is different from food code. Pork in any food containing pork is 155 degrees um, or above. Ground beef and foods containing ground beef is 155. That's the same as the food code, but not the pork. Rare roast beef is 130 degrees. Um, and uh, then again, the intact manufacturer Factures heat and serve packages are usually 140, but always look at the directions on the package. Raw animal foods cooked in a microwave shall be rotated during cooking to compensate for uneven heat distribution. So all the cooking violations would go under number two. And we mentioned potentially hazardous foods that would be reheated, have to be reheated to 165 um, and would have to be held at a temperature of 140 degrees. All food temperature measuring devices must be accurate to plus or minus two um, and shall be provided and used. And that is a violation of number seven and is a six demerit item. Milk and milk products for drinking purposes shall be served from a commercially filled container that can't be any greater than one gallon capacity unless it is drawn from a commercially filled container stored in a mechanically refrigerated bulk milk dispenser um, directly into a drinking utensil. And this would be um, number five on the inspection sheet. Ice must be made, handled, transported, stored, and dispensed in order to pr protect it from contamination. Uh, ice shall be dispensed with scoops, tongs, or other ice dispensing utensils or through automatic ice dispensing equipment. And all of those utensils would have to be stored on a clean surface or in the ice with the dispensing utensil handle extended out of the ice. Um, and then that would also be um, under number five. Ice storage bins must be drained through an air gap, also number five. Rule 3308 is going into food service. Uh, employees preparing or serving food shall wash their hands in accordance with 15A NCAC 18A Rule 3328 of this section and shall either use antibacterial, antibacterial soap, dips, or hand sanitizers immediately prior to food preparation or service or use clean disposable gloves during food preparation or service. Noting again, this is different from the food code and the 2600 rules. Between uses during surface, dispensing utensils shall be stored in the food with the dispensing utensil handle extended out of the food or stored clean and dry. This would be a violation of number 45 on the inspection form. Once served, portions of leftover food shall not be served again unless the package is intact and the food is not potentially hazardous. And this would go under number four on your inspection form. Family style food service is allowed as long as there's supervision. Family style food service may be prohibited during the outbreak and investigation of any communicable diseases. Material used in the construction of utensils and equipment shall under normal use conditions be durable, corrosion resistant, non-absorbent, non-toxic, of sufficient weight and thickness to permit cleaning and sanitizing by normal wear washing methods, Finished to have a smooth, easily cleanable surface and resistant to pitting, chipping, cracking, scratching, scoring, distortion, and decomposition. And any violation of this nature would go under number nine. Solder can be used as long as it's non-toxic, corrosion resistant. Uh, wood and wicker shall not be used as food contact surfaces except for hard maple um, or an equivalent non-absorbent wood that could be used for cutting board or cutting block or bacon, baker's table. Galvanized metal shall not be used for utensils which have general utility or for utensils or food contact equipment with uh, which contacts beverages or moist or hygroscopic food. Linen shall not be used as food contact surfaces except clean linen may be used to uh, be in contact with bread or rolls. 
single use and single service articles shall be fabricated from approved clean materials. Single use articles such as formed buckets, bread wrappers, aluminum pie plates, and number 10 cans shall be used only once and for their original purpose. There are allowances for containers made of plastic, glass, or other food grade material having smooth sides and of a construction so as to be easily cleaned. Equipment and utensils, um, single service articles also that impart odors, color, or taste, or contribute to the contamination of food shall not be reused. Number 12 on your inspection form. Equipment and utensils shall be designed and fabricated to be durable. Product thermometers and thermometer probes shall be metal. Um, met, uh, Multi-use food contact surfaces shall be smooth, free of breaks, open seams, cracks, chips, pits, and similar imperfections. Free of sharp inter internal angles, corners, and crevices. Finished to have smooth welds and joints and accessible for cleaning and inspection without being disassembled. By disassembling without the use of tools, or by easy disassembling with the use of only simple tools, such as mallets, screwdrivers, or wrenches, which are kept near the equipment. Uh, water filters or any other water conditioning device shall be designed to be disassembled uh, to provide for periodic cleaning or replacement. Non-food contact surfaces shall be non-absorbent, cleanable, and free of ledges, projections, and crevices that obstruct cleaning. Interior surfaces of non-food contact equipment shall be designed and fabricated to allow easy cleaning and to facilitate maintenance operations. Filter and filters and other grease extracting equipment shall be readily accessible for filter replacement and cleaning. And all of this would go under number nine. Now we're on to rule 3310. So there are two different specifications for kitchens. One is if the facility is licensed for less than 30 participants, and the other is if they are licensed for more than 30. So first we will review um, issues or conditions that they must meet for less than 30 participants. Domestic kitchen equipment may be used. Uh, they may use multi-service articles, uh, but they have to provide a dishwasher if they are going to do that. In lieu of a dishwasher, though, they can have a two-compartment sink. Um, I'm sorry, in lieu of a dishwasher and a two-compartment sink, they can have a three-compartment sink with drain boards or countertop space of adequate size on each end, um, again, instead of having that dishwasher on hand. A separate lavatory for hand washing is required in food prep areas. Um, and if the dishwasher is not near that area, there may be a need for an additional hand washing sink. A commercial hood shall be installed in accordance with the North Carolina Building Code when foods are fried on site. Now, if licensed for more than 30 participants, approved food service equipment shall be used. Food service equipment shall include a separate food preparation sink with drain boards, it could be required depending on the menu. A separate lavatory for hand washing is required. An additional lavatory could be required again for the dishwashing area if it's separated. And that would be a violation of number eight. And again, a commercial hood if foods are fried on site must be uh, installed in accordance with the North Carolina Building Code. More on 30 or more participants, food service equipment shall include multi-service, at least a three compartment sink with drain boards or countertop space of adequate size on each end, refrigeration equipment and cooking equipment. Now, if they use single service, they must have at least a two compartment sink with drain boards or countertop space uh, of adequate size on each end, refrigeration equipment and cooking equipment or where no meals are prepared on site and only single service articles are used, refrigeration equipment and at least a domestic two compartment sink with drain boards or countertop space of adequate size on each end must be present. Uh, when domestic refrigeration equipment is used, there are some provisions that must apply. Potentially hazardous food shall not be prepared prior to the day of service. Uh, that would be a violation of number three on the inspection form. Potentially hazardous foods that have been heated shall not be reheated or held for later service, and that is a violation of number four. 
and salads containing potentially hazardous food shall not be prepared on site. Uh, so that would be an example of like chicken salad, tuna salad, things like that should not be prepared on site. A violation of number three, all meats, poultry, and fish shall be purchased in pre-portioned, ready-to-cook form, um, and that only applies to 30 or more participant facilities. Multi-use tableware shall be washed, rinsed, and sanitized after each use, and that would be a violation of number 10. Food, code, co food contact surfaces of equipment and utensils shall be washed, rinsed, and sanitized between raw and ready-to-eat foods, between types of raw animal products such as beef, fish, lamb, pork, and poultry, after any contamination may have occurred, when needed, after final use each working day, and lastly, non-food contact surfaces of equipment shall be cleaned as often as necessary to keep the equipment free of accumulation of dust, dirt, food particles, and other debris. Adult day service facilities licensed for or serving food to 30 or more participants shall provide and use a three compartment sink with drain boards or countertop space of adequate size on each end if a multi-service eating and drinking utensil um, if they're manually cleaned and sanitized. Equipment and utensils shall be pre-flushed or pre-scraped. Specifications for proper wash, rinse, and sanitize are there on the screen for you. Sinks shall be cleaned and sanitized prior to use. Washed and then dishes must be, or utensils must be washed in the first compartment, rinsed in the second, and sanitized in the third compartment. And there are a couple of choices for obtaining the correct sanitization. Uh, the first option is hot water, 170 degrees for at least one minute. At least 50 parts per million of available chlorine at a temperature of at least 75 degrees Fahrenheit. At least 12.5 parts per million of iodine um, at a temperature of at least 75 degrees. Or at least 200 parts per million quaternary ammonium products and having a temperature of at least 75 degrees. An approved testing method or equipment used in accordance with the product manufacturer's instructions shall be available. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Convenient and regularly used to test chemical sanitizers to ensure minimum prescribed strengths. And any of this, uh, if it's not in, in um, compliance, will be a violation of number 15. Large or impractical to sanitize in a dishwashing machine or dishwashing sink uh, utensils. May uh, you may use a spray on, wipe on sanitizer. Um, spray on or wipe on sanitizer shall be pre prepared daily and kept on hand for bactericidal treatment. When hot water is used for sanitizing, the following facility shall be provided and used. An approved heating device or fixture capable of maintaining the water at a temperature of at least 170 degrees, a numerically scaled indicating thermometer accurate to plus or minus three degrees, convenient to the sink for frequent checks of water temp, dish baskets to permit complete immersion of the tableware, kitchenware, and equipment in the hot water, and then after sanitization, all equipment and utensils shall be air dried. And this picture shows a booster heater, and a booster heater um, could be on the bottom of the sink, as was shown here. Also, dishwashers may be equipped with a booster heater to get that water to 170 degrees. Rule 30, I'm sorry, yeah, 3113, indicating thermometers accurate to plus or minus three degrees shall be provided for commercial dishwashing equipment to indicate the temperature of the water in each tank of the machine and the temperature of the final rinse water as it enters the manifold. So you see those indicating thermometers there in the picture um, of wash, rinse, and sanitized. Drain boards or countertop space of adequate size for the proper handling of sold utensils prior to washing and cleaning utensils following sanitization shall be provided. Chemicals may be used, providing that a tested testing method or equipment is available. All dishwashing machines shall be thoroughly cleaned at least once each day or more often when necessary to maintain them in operating condition. After sanitization, all equipment and utensils shall be air dried. 
Cleaned and sanitized equipment and utensils shall be protected from contamination. Cleaned and sanitized utensils and equipment shall be stored above the floor, of course, protecting them from dust, insects, drip, splash, and any other contamination, and facilitating floor cleaning. The food contact services of fixed equipment shall also be protected from contamination. Single service articles shall be purchased only in clean containers, shall be stored in a clean dry container until used, and shall be handled in accordance with the rules of this section. The vi a violation of this nature would be number 14. So let's dive deeper into water supply, rule 3315. Uh, of course, running water under pressure must be provided in sufficient quantities uh, to meet all the needs of the facility, and it must um, it must also maintain the pressure that is required by the North Carolina Plumbing Code. A violation here would go under number 16. The water supply shall meet the requirements of either 18C rules or the 18A 1700 rules. Um, and a sample shall be collected by the environmental health specialist and submitted to a state certified laboratory for bacteriological analysis. Other tests of water quality as indicated by possible sources of contamination may be collected by the EHS. And this would be a violation of number 16. No cross connections with an unapproved water supply shall exist. If potential backflow conditions exist, an approved backflow prevention device shall be provided. That would be a violation of number 18. Further into water supply, water heating equipment shall be provided. Capacity and recovery rates should be based on number and size of sinks, capacity of dishwashing machines, capacity of laundering machines, clothing changing facilities, and other food service and cleaning needs. Hot and cold water under pressure shall be ex easily accessible to all areas necessary. Hot water heating equipment shall provide hot water as follows. And you see on your slide a minimum of 140 degrees when at the point of use when the hot water is used for sanitizing. So if there is a machine or a booster heater that is using hot water for sanitizing, again, this is different from the food code, um, the water must come out and be 140 degrees. At a temperature of no less than 90 and no more than 120 at hand sinks and in other areas accessible to pay participants in kitchens not used to prepare meals, so like activity kitchens. This would be a violation of number 17. Drinking fountains of an approved type of, or individual drinking cups shall constitute approved drinking water facilities. Drinking fountains, if approved, shall be of sanitary angled jet, as you see in the picture, designed and kept clean. The pressure shall be regulated so the individual's mouth does not come in contact with the nozzle so that the water does not splash on the floor. All multi-use utensils used for drinking purposes shall be easily cleanable, cleaned, and sanitized after each use. Single service articles used for drinking water shall be stored and handled so as not to become contaminated by insects, splash, dust, and other contamination. This all would be a violation of number 19 on your inspection form. Y'all still hanging? We're over halfway through. All toilet fixtures and toilet rooms shall be located to comply with the requirements of this section. And any issue here would be number 20 on your inspection form. I didn't mention this, but the rule number here is 13, I'm sorry, 3317. Uh, storage is not really allowed in toilet rooms. Um, it should be limited to the toileting and clothing changing supplies um, and maybe a few cleaning supplies that can be stored um, in a locked cabinet. All toilet fixtures shall be easily cleanable and in good repair. And any violations noted here would go under 31 on the inspection sheet. Toilet fixtures shall be cleaned and sanitized when sold, and at least on a daily basis. A solution of 100 parts per million chlorine or equivalent methods approved by the department shall be used for sanitizing. This would be a violation of number 21. Lavatory shall be sized and located to comply with the appropriate hand washing requirements of this section. Easily cleanable in good repair and kept free of storage. 
Anything seen here would be a violation of number 21. All lavatories and bathing facilities shall be equipped with hot and cold running water through a mixing faucet, except that automatic mixing faucets or pre-mixing devices which provide water at the temperature specified in Rule 3315E of this section. Oh, sorry. Lavatories shall be cleaned and sanitized as needed and at least on a daily basis. A solution of 100 parts per million chlorine or other approved methods shall be used for sanitizing. Again, this is a violation of number 21. Soap and disposable towels or heated air hand drying device uh, shall be provided. Again, these rules are a bit outdated. Uh, so you may see another type of air drying device that's not heat, uh, but these rules do say they should have either disposable towels or heated air hand dryer. And this will be a violation of number 23 on the inspection form. Hand washing signs shall be posted at each employee hand washing lavatory. That is a violation of number 29. Also, yes, a solution of 100 parts per, per million chlorine must be used on lavatories and bathing facilities. Rule 3318, uh, if bathing facilities or hydrotherapy equipment are provided, they have to be kept clean. Bathing equipment, which is contact with participants' skin, shall be cleaned with a detergent and then disinfected with an EPA-listed germicidal disinfectant between participants. Manufacturer's instructions shall be followed for cleaning equipment and pumps. A supply of cleaning and disinfectant agents shall be accessible to bathing areas, and anything here would be a violation of 21. Chemical test kits shall be used to test the concentration of disinfectants mixed on, mixed on site, and this will be uh, under number 27. Clothing changes shall be done in restrooms or other areas designated for that purpose, and if not, that's a violation of number 25. Clothing changing surfaces shall be smooth, non-absorbent, easily cleanable, and shall be approved by the department. Clothing changing surfaces shall be kept free of storage, this will be a violation of number 28 on our inspection form and shall be cleaned with a mild solution of water and detergent and then sanitized after each changing with a solution that is 100 parts per million chlorine or equivalent methods approved by the department. A testing method or kit shall be available and used daily to measure sanitizer, concentration, and ensure compliance with the minimum prescribed strength. These solutions shall be used from hand pump spray bottles, which are labeled to identify the contents. This will be a violation of number 27. Each clothing changing area shall also include a hand washing lavatory. The use of disposable gloves by caregivers during the clothing changing process is required if the worker has cuts or sores on hands or chapped hands. Gloves shall be discarded after use. Caregivers may dispose, sorry, uh oh, I went too far, um, of feces in the toilet, and soiled clothing shall be placed in a tightly closed plastic bag or other equivalent container and sent daily to the partic participant's home or if there is a laundry area there at the facility to be laundered. Clothing shall not be rinsed except where a utility sink is provided for that purpose. Only pre-moistened towelettes or paper towels shall be used for cleaning participants during the changing process. Soiled paper or towelettes shall be discarded after use in a covered plastic lined receptacle, number 26 on the inspection form. Storage. Did I do that one? Yes. Okay. Sorry. It didn't look like it moved. <laughs> storage 3320. Rooms or spaces shall be provided for the storage of equipment, furniture, clothes, beds, cots, mats, and supplies, and shall be kept clean. Shelving or other storage constructed in a manner to facilitate cleaning shall be provided for orderly storage of supplies and equipment. All hazardous substances shall be stored in a locked storage room or cabinet, locked with a combination lock or key, 
except that at psychosocial rehabilitation programs where participants need access to chemicals, keys shall be kept out of the reach of participants and shall not be stored in the lock. A properly mixed sanitizing solution and a mild detergent solution may be out for use. These solutions shall be clearly labeled. Medications not under the control of the participant shall be stored in a separate locked cabinet or other locked container. Medications which, were, which require refrigeration shall be stored in a locked box or locked container in a refrigerator. And this would be a violation of number 30 on the inspection form. All beds, chairs, cots, and mats shall be clean, in good repair, and stored to protect them from splash, drip, and other contamination. This would be a violation of number 32. Individual beds used for sleeping, sorry guys, my goodness, shall be covered with waterproof washable material and shall be equipped with individual linen. And this would be a violation of number 33. All bed linen shall be kept clean and in good repair and shall be changed between participant uses. Linen shall be large enough to cover the sleeping surface. More on linen, 1321. Linen shall be stored with the individual mat or cot until laundered or stored individually for a participant in a designated if taken area if taken off the mats or cots. 34 on the inspection form. Linen shall be laundered a minimum of one time per week or more often if sold. Linen used for more than one participant shall be laundered between users. Linen used in clothing changing areas shall be changed and laundered when sold or at least on a daily basis. Now let's talk about furniture, um, equipment, and activity supplies. And that's a pretty typical um, furniture activity room you would see with furniture in it uh, in these adult day service facilities. So the furniture, equipment, and activity supplies provided by the facility shall be of easily cleanable construction and shall be kept clean and in good repair. And any issue here would be noted on number 35. Employees shall wear clean outer clothing and shall be clean as to their person uh, and methods of food handling and participant care. Employees shall keep their fingernails clean and trimmed. Hair nets, caps, or similar hair restraints shall be worn by employees engaged in preparation or service of food. Tobacco use in any form is prohibited in the food prep area. Persons with a communicable disease or communicable, communicable condition shall be excluded. Volunteer personnel shall adhere to the same requirements in these rules as employees. And there are quite a few places on your form where personnel issues can be marked. Um, they are 36, 37, 38, and 39. Floors and floor coverings of all food preparation, food storage, utensil washing areas, toilet rooms, maintenance rooms, utility rooms, and laundry areas shall be constructed of non-absorbent, easily cleanable, durable material. Carpet, if used, must be installed to prevent hazards or obstacles to cleaning and easily and be easily cleanable. Carpeting is prohibited in food preparation areas, equipment and utensil washing areas, food storage areas, laundry areas, and toilet rooms. All floors shall be kept clean and maintained in good repair. Carpeting shall be kept clean and dry. And any issues here would be number 40. The walls and ceilings, including doors and windows of all rooms and areas, shall be kept clean, in good repair, and free of microbial growth. All walls shall be non-absorbent and easily cleanable. Ceilings and rooms in which food is stored, handled, or prepared, utensil washing rooms, and toilet rooms shall be non-absorbent and easily cleanable. Acoustic ceiling material may be used where ventilation precludes the possibility of grease and moisture absorption. All rooms and enclosed areas shall be well lighted by natural or artificial means. Lighting shall be capable of illuminating to at least 50 foot candles at food preparation work surfaces, at least 10 foot candles of light at 30 inches above the floor um, shall be provided in all other areas, including storage areas. Light fixtures in all areas shall be kept clean and in good repair. 
completely shielded bulbs or shatterproof bulbs shall be used in the food prep storage and serving areas. All rooms used by participants shall be heated, cooled, and ventilated. Yep, we can mark them for heated and cooled and ventilated. And must maintain a temperature between 65 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Ventilation may be in the form of operable windows. Um, they must be screened, of course, or by means of mechanical ventilation um, from the outside. Windows and window treatment shall be kept clean and in good repair. And then all ventilation equipment, including heating and cooling vents and all fans and all special ventilation equipment, which is required for kitchens and toilet rooms, shall be kept clean and in good repair. And you can find these violations under 41 and 42 of our inspection form. A person who becomes ill at the adult day service facility has to be separated from the other participants until they are able to leave. Each adult day service facility shall include a designated area for a person who becomes ill. When in use, such area shall be equipped with a bed or cot or mat, a vomitous receptacle. All materials shall be sanitized after each use. Linens and disposables shall be changed after each use. If the area is not separate, um, is not a separate room, it shall be separated from space used by other participants. Um, by a partition or screen or some other means. This designated area shall be proximate to a toilet and lavatory and where health and sanitation measures can be carried out without interrupting activities or other participants and staff. Ill people are not allowed to go into food areas or um, uh, food handling areas or food prep areas. Facilities providing adult day health service shall have a treatment room, which is separate from areas used for storage and handling of food. The treatment room shall have a hand sink or have a doorway which connects it to the room containing a sink. And anything here would be a violation of 43 um, or 44. Hand washing. Employees shall be instructed that hand washing is the single most important line of defense in preventing the transmission of disease causing organisms. Employees shall wash hands as listed in the slide. And this would be a violation of number 45, rule 3328. Be a second to look over that slide. Participants shall wash hands as listed on the slide as well. Proper hand washing procedures shall include using soap and tempered water, rubbing hands vigorously for soap and tempered water for 15 seconds, washing all the surfaces of the hands, including the backs of hands, palms, wrists, under fingernails, and between fingers, rinsing well for 10 seconds, drying hands with a paper towel or mechanical dryer, and turning off the faucet with the paper towel. This would be a violation of number 45 on the inspection sheet. All right, we're still in 3328, hand washing. Proper hand washing procedures shall include using soap and tempered water, rubbing hands together vigorously for, with soap and tempered water for 15 seconds, washing all surfaces of the hands, including the backs of hands, palms, wrists, under fingernails, and between fingers, rinsing well for 10 seconds, drying hands with a paper towel or mechanical dryer, turning off the faucet with your paper towel, and then you have done proper hand washing when you've done all those things. So uh, this will be a violation of number 45. All wastewater shall be disposed of in a publicly owned wastewater treatment system or by an approved properly operating on-site wastewater system. If issues are noted with the on-site system, notify the supervisor or environmental health specialist authorized in the on-site wastewater program. Any issue here would be under number 46. The picture clearly shows a failing septic system. Solid waste kept in containers such as standard garbage cans. Uh, they must be covered with tight lids when filled or stored and um, or not in continuous use. Refuse, including scrap paper, <clears throat> cardboard boxes, and similar items shall be stored in containers, rooms, or designated areas. 
facilities. Sorry. Uh, went too far. Uh, facilities shall be provided for the washing and storage of all garbage cans and mops for adult day service, um, except for facility certified or licensed for fewer than 13 participants. Cleaning facilities shall include a combination faucet, hot and cold running water, threaded nozzle, and curved impervious pad sloped to drain into an approved sanitary west sewage system. Where containerized systems are used for garbage storage, facilities shall be provided for the cleaning of such systems. A contract for off-site cleaning shall constitute compliance with the section. Solid waste shall be disposed of as so as to prevent insect breeding and public health nuisances. And these violations can be found under 47 and 48. Now to the pet pest nuisances. Uh, unrestrained animals of any kind shall not be allowed in the adate dual service facility, including the outdoor areas. Um, animals shall not be allowed to pass through the food prep area. Animal cages, bedding, litter boxes, and other pet related items shall be um, kept clean. And that would be a violation of number 51. Effective measures shall be taken to keep insects, rodents, and other vermin out um, and prevent them breed from breeding, which will be number 50 on the insection form. All openings to the outer air shall be protected against the entrance of flying insects. Insecticides shall not come in contact with food, utensils, or equipment in food preparation and serving um, or with any other food contact surface. And then, of course, um, as with all pesticides and all of our rules, they must be registered with the EPA and the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Sciences. Okay. Pesticides shall be used in accordance with the directions on the manufacturer's label and shall be stored in a locked storage room or cabinet separate from foods and medications. Now, one thing I did not mention about the unrestrained animals is that service or patrol animals are allowed, and um, we, we can provide further information on that if needed. Outdoor areas, getting close, gang. The premises, including the outdoor area, shall be kept clean, drained, and free of litter and hazardous materials. Grass and other vegetation shall be maintained in a manner which does not encourage the harborage of vermin. All debris, glass, dilapidated structures, gosh, sorry, um, and broken equipment shall be removed. The outdoor area shall be free from unprotected wells, grease traps, cisterns, and utility equipment. And that would go under number 52 on the inspection form. So if they want to have a swimming pool, even this little cute little blue baby pool, uh, they cannot do that. They have to meet the rules governing the sanitation of swimming pools, rules 2500. So you would need to get with the um, state pools and institutions and tattoos branch regarding them wanting a pool. Market instructions are also listed in this, uh, this part of the rules, so 3334. And this is where it talks to you about the um, the classification that they they receive uh, based on the inspection that you took. So it could be superior, approved, provisional, or disapproved. Um, and that's based on the compliance with the rules of this section. <coughs> Excuse me. The classification card shall be posted in the facility in a conspicuous place designated by the EHS. And once posted, this classification card shall not be removed except by or upon the instruction of the EHS. The degree of compliance is indicated by the total demerit point score, which is shown on the sanitation inspection of adult day service facility form. Um, for the purpose of issuing a license and a certificate to a new operator, a sanitation inspection of adult day service facility form shall be forwarded to the licensing or certified agency only when the facility can be granted a superior classification. These classifications here are listed um, on, on the inspection form uh, for reference. An adult day service facility shall be classified as superior if the total demerit score is not more than 15 and they have no six-point demerit items. 
they um, can be classified as approved if they have no more than 15 and not more than 30. I'm sorry, more than 15, not more than 30, and no six point demerit items. And they would be classified as provisional if any six point demerit items are violated um, and or if the total score is above 30, but no more than 45 points. Um, and then disapproved is if the demerit score is 46 or above, uh, then that would warrant a disapproved sanitation classification. Um, let me just see what I'm doing. Let me read that. If the provisional status period exceeds seven days or the adult day service facility is in disapproved status, the licensing or certified agency shall be notified immediately by forwarding a copy of the inspection report to either the licensing or certified agency. Then the EHS shall notify the licensing or certified agency in accordance with Section 3303 of this um, of this section, we talked about that. That was, uh, they have to be notified within 24 hours and then notified in writing um, within two days. So uh, the appeals procedure, issues that arise during the inspection can be appealed by the operator if they disagree with the REHS's interpretation or enforcement of the rules. You have reached, we have reached the end of this presentation. If you have any questions about this, uh, presentation, please contact your regional specialist. Thanks.